been using LabVIEW for about 26 years now, um, and uh, pretty much full-time professionally. Um, I was a LabVIEW champion starting in 2014. I I've trained 14 LabVIEW architects, one of which is him. He's going to be 15. Someday soon, we'll see. Do you do that as a service? Or do I do it as a service? Uh, it depends on how much I'm paid. I actually was paid once to train someone um, that was at a CLD level to help them get up to CLA level. So it's at least hypothetically possible. Mostly, I guess, people mostly people in the company, almost entirely. <laughs> uh, I can tell that story, sure. Uh, has anyone here been to a talk called 10 Things I Hate About LabVIEW? Okay, yeah, that was me. <laughs> that was in 2006-2007 time period. Um, the great thing about that talk, first of all, it was like completely and totally packed, like wall to wall. It was insane. People were sitting in the aisles, and the front row was actually chairs and whatnot. And right here was Jeff Kadoski. <laughs> so a little bit of pressure there, but I, I think it went well. Um, and uh, I can, I can, I'll tell another story. So um, I actually am personally that talk was responsible for one thing in LabVIEW. Uh, I was told this by the developer who implemented it. So Brian Powell uh, was uh, one of the key LabVIEW developers. And he went to my talk. In my talk, I ranted and raved about some things about LabVIEW, but in a playful way that was really focused on how to not do things poorly um, and good software engineering practices. I was talking about conventions. And one thing that had really annoyed me that I included in the talk was the icon connector. So back in the day, when you would bring up the lab UVI, it wouldn't have a pattern at all, like way back in the day. You'd have to pick one. And then they improved things by counting the number of controls and indicators in the front panel and picking one that had the same number of controls and indicators, which would seem like a big advantage. But my point was that that's stupid. We should just pick 4224 and be done with it. Like, because if you have more than that, you probably need to start thinking about doing something differently. And if you have fewer than that, you probably want room to expand. And according to Brian, he says, well, I got done with that talk, and I thought, you know, he's right. So he jumped into his car, drove to National Insurance Headquarters, and made the change then. That made 4224 the default pattern connector in my view. So there you go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's see, are we? Are we on time? All right. So my last talk, um, I don't know if it's because I was nervous or because I speak quickly anyway or because my audience wasn't necessarily that interactive, but I got done kind of early. And I really want to feel like you all get your money for the, or get, your, get value out of your money for this presentation. So if I'm going too quickly, raise your hand. If you feel like you would like to interact, interact. Ask questions. Interrupt me. There are some opportunities for audience participation coming up. Take full advantage of those opportunities. Um, or if you really have to go to the bathroom, just sit there and be quiet. And we'll, I'll get you first in line. I'll be at the door. OK, so who is this talk aimed at? Well, does anyone in the room develop lab applications? OK, that's good. Does anyone in the room use something that they would call a queued message handler or a queued state machine? Uh, as old dogs call it a queued state machine still, I suspect. I know our toolkit is called JetQSM. I'm not here to sell you a toolkit. I'll offer it to you, but uh, I'm not here to talk about it. Um, this talk is really about the principles behind conventions that apply to queued state machines and queued message handlers. Um, I assume that everyone creates user interfaces on occasion. Yeah. OK, good. And most importantly, does anybody, and I know this is probably not very many people, does anyone have requirements that change during development? <laughs> yes? OK, a few of us, yes. That would be all of us, really. Um, so this is who I'm aiming my talk at. Um, so what I'm hoping is that by the end of this talk, you'll have a kind of new paradigm to think about 
when you are programming your cube message handler. I'm going to give you some conventions that you can decide if they're garbage or they're great. I will tell you I've been using these conventions um, over the last 20 years and found them very valuable. You may have better ones. That's totally fine. I'd love to hear about them. Um, this is not the God's gospel truth, but it is just recommendations that I would give to my junior programmers. Uh, well, okay, they're my junior programmers. They're mandates. But for you, if, if <laughs> um, not being directly under me, then there are suggestions for you, things to consider adopting that I think will provide a lot of value. All right. So, MVC, Model View Controller. Raise your hand if you don't really know. This first exposure to MVC. Yeah? Okay, good. Good. I'm going to pause before getting into the slide and tell you my first exposure to MVC was at the CLA Summit. If you are a CLA and you have not attended the CLA Summit, if you are not a CLA, you have not attended the CLA Summit, all of you people, you need to make sure that you go to a CLA summit. Almost everyone at a CLA summit will tell you they would much rather go to a CLA summit than MI week. And the reason isn't because all those people are cool, because frankly, they're pretty geeky. But um, the reason is because the technical content and the amount of, of uh, mental stimulus and whatnot is very, very high at a CLA summit. It is really cool to be there with all these smart people that are coming up with all these challenging ideas. Um, so some of the best, most interesting things that have happened in my career have been at CLA Summit. So if you are not a CLA, you need to become a CLA, if only to attend the CLA Summit. And if you are a CLA and you've not been to a CLA Summit, then I'm, I'm really sorry for you, and you should fix that problem. Okay, so I learned, all of this I learned at a CLA Summit. Well, actually, this I learned on Wikipedia, but I initially learned it at the CLA Summit. So model view controller, this is what Wikipedia says, and everyone knows Wikipedia knows everything. So the concept is that there are three parts of your program, that there's a model, and there's a view, and there's a controller. Now the user interface is going to interact with the controller. The controller is going to change the model. The model is going to update the view, and which is going to then display to the user. All right? This is the sort of theoretical construct for model view controller as presented by Wikipedia. The idea uh, is that by dividing these into three interconnected parts, it separates internal representations and responsibilities in your program. So it starts decoupling your software by definition. This is a great idea. In fact, there have been a number of talks at CLA Summits and NI Weeks about, hey, here's how I took this idea and did something. Right. Now. Why separate the view? This, I think, is the biggest challenge that I see when I look at people's code. And that is they don't naturally separate the view from the other parts, from the model and the controller. And so I'm sure this has never happened to you, but let's just assume that I'm writing code for a tester, because we do tests, right? Um, and I have a start test button, all right? And I want the start test button to be disabled when the test name string is empty, OK? So I start out my initialized case. I set the um, the test start test button to disable, and then in my test name string event uh, event case for value change, I might set it to not disabled. Right? Good implementation, right? Well, but what if I also need to disable it when the comment string is empty? Well, that becomes more complicated because I have a a property node in my initialized case to disable. I have a property node in my test name string. To disable it, so now I need to put another one in my comment string. And so, what about the ands and the ors of these conditions? Or what if my system mode is e stop? Clearly, you can't start a test if your system is an e stop, right? So you have to disable it then. Or what if there's a test active bit, like the test has already started? Well, if the test has already started. You probably want to disable the start test button, right? You can see this is starting to get complicated. Or what if no user is logged in, right? And the software has to automatically log the user out after five minutes of inactivity. So now, because of the user not doing something, my test, the, the start test button has to disable. How would you deal with that if you don't separate the display of the start test button from each of these individual conditions? So this is a, an example of how separating the view from everything else will really get you some benefit. 
or this is this is an example of how not separating them won't get you some benefit. Um, I do have a key question here, which really um, is begged by this whole scenario, and is how many property nodes for a given control is too many? You don't have an answer. How many property nodes is too many? You have one control. How many property nodes is too many property nodes? The answer is two. My aspiration, when I write code, I might need a property node. I want to have one property node for that control. Now, is that always practical? Maybe not. Is this implicit or explicit property nodes? Okay, good question. So what you're talking about when you say implicit property nodes, you're talking about you have a control reference, and then you wire it to a property node. By explicit, what he's saying is that you have a property node that's statically linked to a control. Okay, so this is where philosophy comes in and, and sort of preference. My preference is to have everything statically linked. The reason I have this preference is because I would like to right click on a control and find that property node immediately when I'm debugging. Um, I think that's not as uh, scalable and reusable as it would be to use control references. So I understand some people prefer to use control references. For me in my work though, I'm doing so many one-off systems that I don't find the reusable use case quite as valuable as I do in the speed of, of debugging. So um, for me, I am, I'm going for one property node. Now you can see from all these conditions that implication is that I'm only going to be updating that property node in one place. I'm going to be do doing the logic on all these different conditions in one place. And that's what I mean by separating the view. Um, so you, we'll talk about that in more detail later on. Any other questions? So again, this is the context of my talk. I redid this a little bit um, from what Wikipedia says because in my mind, the user doesn't actually interface with the controller. Right? The, user inter the user interfaces with the user interface. So when I'm talking about the view, I'm talking about the user interface. Um, and so the view modifies the controller, and then the controller modifies the model. The, model, uh, the view decides what to display based on the model. Um, and I'm also using these colored boxes for the rest of the presentation. So blue means model, orange means controller, green means view. All right, so I'd like to teach this based on a case study. So there is this new venture capital company that contacted me last week. And they have an idea. They're going to rent Blu-ray discs to customers. And they're going to put these, these, these kiosks at uh, retail locations all across the country, and they're going to call themselves Blue Box. Okay, so you're going to go there, and you're going to you're going to get your Blu-ray movies from your Blue Box. And they hired our team collectively uh, to develop software to act as the very first prototype of this newfangled thing. And of course, our first decision was to implement it as a queued message handler because that's convenient for my talk. So. <clears throat> So we're going to do some high-level design thinking. First decision we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what? I would like to capture the reality that this module knows. Okay. So this is everything that my device needs to know at any given time to be able to rent a movie. <coughs> it's not actions. It's stuff that it knows. Okay. So you might think of some examples in your mind. Um, then I'm going to record. Uh, and then I'm going to recognize that I'm going to need to present portions of that reality to the operator, right? So then the last thing is I need to allow the module to change that reality based on user interaction. Now this is kind of philosophy, but basically the decision number one, capturing the reality the module knows, I call that the model. It's everything that they need that the mod that the device needs to know to operate. The view is that part, the presentation of portions of reality. And then allowing it to change the reality based on user interaction. So in a simple case, the reality might be which disks are in the box right now. Right? The view might be when you present, some of the movies might be grayed out because they're not available, or might be bold because they are available. Or if you were in a list view, maybe it would only list the ones that are available. The controller um, would be when a user takes something out of inventory, it has to be able to update that reality of what do I have available to me at this time. When a user returns a movie, that changes the reality, if you will, of um, 
that this device knows. Right? One other key point about this idea of reality, and that is my concept here is that this includes everything that it needs to know. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Okay, so when we go into this, we're gonna focus just on the use case of a customer renting movie. If you'd like to do homework after this presentation, um, then you can think about the customer returning movies or a technician that's stalking the unit or the home office that's monitoring the unit. But right now, we're just gonna focus on customer goes to the device to rent the movie. So, what might your software have to know? Okay, I've given you I've given you a head start. It has to know what's in inventory. So, what else might it need to know in order to successfully allow a user to rent a movie? Who the user is. Who the user is. So, you might have a user login. Maybe that gives them special benefits because they're in a reward program or something, right? That'd be good. Um, or you need to track them down to get your movie back. Maybe so. Who else? Yes? Payment information. Payment information about the user. They will need to know that. Now, it's uh, they're going to need to be able to access that. And then when they make the transaction, they'll need to know that. They might not need to know that beforehand. But maybe someday, you know, if you go and it'll do, it'll do retinal recognition, it'll automatically know your, your payment information, right? OK. What else? The cost of the rental, right. Now that might be standard for all discs, or it might be a different price for each disc because the hot new movie costs an extra buck. Who knows? Right? So that's information that will have to know. Anything else? The transaction. Say again? The date of the transaction. Yes, yeah, so it will need to know some information about the date so that and the time so that way it knows when you have to return it or it's going to start charging you more money. That's definitely important. When can I charge my customer more money? What's that? The name of the movie. The name of the movie, yeah, which one the user has selected. So user, that's a, we're getting a little closer to controller, right, because the user input then is affecting their reality, but that's okay. All right, so all these things, this is all information that the reality in which this device operates. This is all stuff that goes into the model. All that stuff we listed, I'm going to call model. All right, so what might the software have to present to the user? Yeah, the list of movies available, for sure. The cost of movies again, yep. Think of anything else? Is that? Story about the movie. Yeah, so synopsis information. So if they select a movie, might give a little short sales spiel about why this movie is the greatest movie on earth. Maybe list like the awards that it's gotten, something like that, sure. Availability? Yeah? Gotta go back to the user information so that you can see who you are. <laughs> yeah, so it might it might reflect back some of the information that you've entered um, as a user. For sure. Return date. Yep. Return date. Error messages. <laughs> Hopefully there's no error messages, but you know, sometimes my card isn't necessarily gonna work the first time I swipe it, right? For sure. Uh, another thing you might think about is when you select a movie, do you have do you does does like say the our competitor to Blue Box does it um, immediately dispense a movie when you select a movie? It doesn't. What does it do? Right. So that's the idea of the shopping cart, right? You would like to prompt your customer to rent as many movies as possible to increase your income. So uh, it might have some kind of presentation of a shopping cart, which then implies, wait a minute, in our model discussion, we didn't talk about a shopping cart. So now we have to include in our model, all right, here are, is a list of movies that the user has definitively decided to rent. Okay, you can see where we're going with this. This, all that stuff we talked about is all view. So it's just presentation of the information that's already in the model. The, the, the view is completely separated from the model. Right? There's stuff that you know, and then there's stuff that you're presenting at this moment. All right, so now what, does, what might the software have to do? What are the changes to this reality that we might have to do? So we talked about one already, removing a disk from inventory, right? Anything else? 
starting the customer, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sorted based on my genre? Yep, absolutely. Updating inventory? Maybe updating prices. You brought up pricing before. What if uh, one day a customer has a big announcement? It's like, oh, hey, by the way, everything is going to cost another dime per night. Yeah, that's a good point. You could do it that way for sure. Okay, so those are just some examples of stuff you would have to do. And as you might suspect, this is the controller aspect. So basically, changes to the reality of the device is controller. Presentation of that reality is view. So how do we code this up? So this is a picture of the only lab view we're going to show, I think, on this presentation, um, of Jet's version of a QSM. So this set of boxes down here is the Jet QSM toolkit. And this pink line is just a reference wire. But the concept is, with the QSM, you're probably all familiar with, this function is going to output, OK, what state is it going to run? And this right here is where we might enqueue uh, new ones. I don't really like the uh, names, the queued state machine, queued message handler. Message handler implies somebody else is telling me what to do. Queued driven message handler has the same problem. Really what we're talking about is case navigation. A, a better name might be QTM, queued task machine, something like that. Um, I'm not going to change the verbiage, though. You're familiar with what it is, probably. So in this example here, if we have a start test button, we push start test, and it's going to execute three states, open file, start DAC, and send, send start command as an example. Okay. okay. Our first step in queuing this all up is to develop or choose a queued message handler toolkit. All right? So uh, you can absolutely homebrew these. They're not very difficult to do. Uh, you, uh, Delacor has DQMH, you're probably all familiar with that acronym, maybe some of you use it. Um, I'm not too familiar with it, because I had my own tool when I developed 20 years ago, and I'm still using. Um, JKI has a state machine toolkit. If you email me and introduce yourself, I'd be more than willing to send you mine. I'm um, not here to promote or sell that toolkit. Um, and uh, there's probably others out there that you're familiar with. Maybe you have your favorite, maybe you developed your own. That's great. But the first thing you have to do is pick one, right? OK. So here's where MVC meets the QMH. So I'm going to map the model, the view, and the controller to portions of the QMH. First of all, the model. The model is state data that is stored in the ship register. OK, so anything that you want to remember from state to state to state, I'm going to call that the model. Okay. View is obviously front panel elements. Now, it maybe you have multiple views. For now, let's just assume we only have one QMH, so maybe you've got like a tab control, and so your various views are, are part of the tab control. So which tab you're showing at the moment is actually part of the, the view status information um, in, that's presented. And then you have the business logic, so all the stuff that you need to do, right, that would all be controller stuff. Now, the model I'm going to call the status cluster. Um, there are definitely people that are passionate about not having a the status cluster, but I use a the status cluster. So I have one status cluster. It contains all, everything. It contains my reality. It does not contain my reality of stuff that I don't care about. So if I have a system that has, you know, say 50 different independent loops that are running, they all have their own status clusters, and that status information is unique for each of those 50. It's only the reality that that particular queued message handler cares about. right? So I'm not trying to replicate all kinds of status information. Um, and a, another point here is um, I really don't prefer using globals or functional globals at all. I get data into that status cluster using messages. That's how I do it. Um, so you, you don't want to use global very global or global type variables for data communication, because that leads to problems. Front panel elements, the view is not only the elements, though. It's all of the states that update those elements. Now you may think to yourself, hmm, well, it may be that if the user presses a button, then I want to react by disabling something else. And so I would have in my value change state in my event case, some kind of property node. And my answer to that is no, you don't. You don't want to do that. The states that update front panel elements are completely independent. 
And we'll talk more about that later. And then business logic and all the states that contain it. So the business logic would be anything that changes the, uh, the reality. So when you dispense, the, the, the kind of the logic behind dispensing and removing something from inventory, if you're changing the reality that that device knows that you are doing a controller function. We want to separate that. So the view obviously has two parts. The view has inputs and outputs. So the view for inputs, it's found in the event structure, right? Because that's how you get uh, event changes for your controls. Um, so it's going to read from control terminal events, and it's going to write it into the status cluster, our model. And then it's going to navigate, potentially, to a controller state. Right? So the user uh, selected a movie. So the, the movie that's selected is going to go into the state information. And then the controller might go and say, remove it from inventory, or verify that it is actually inventory, or look up the price. There's lots of things that could be done in response to the user selecting a given movie. It does not write to terminals or locals or globals. It does not use property nodes and methods. It does not perform business logic. Because all of those are things that the viewer or the controller are responsible for. You do not do that. Or the view output. The other side of view is the output. So the view is going to update all of the controls and indicators. Okay? It's going to read information from the status cluster. In other words, the view, all it's doing is presenting the current state of reality to the user. It's going to write information to indicator terminals. It's going to write information to local variables for the controls, if that's relevant. And it's going to use control and indicator property nodes. But it will not write to the status cluster. If you're writing to the status cluster, and by definition, you are either capturing data in the view inputs or you're changing reality in the controller. It's not going to read from terminals or locals or globals. It should just be reading from the reality, the model. And it is not going to be performing business logic because that's what the controller does. Okay, the controller. The controller is going to read information from the status cluster. It's going to operate on that information. And it's going to write information back into the status cluster and then it's going to navigate to view. So that way it can present this information. So an example of that might be um, we are updating the total cost of the customer's purchase because they have just either selected or deselected a movie. So it's a pretty simple operation as long as you know how much the movie costs. So you'll take, okay, what, what is the movie? Are they adding it or they're removing it? Then it has to look up in the database how much does that movie cost. It has to get out the, the total sum and add or subtract put the new value into the status cluster, and then we navigate the view. Okay, and it doesn't read information from terminals or locals or globals. That's all part of view. So let's talk about the model. Like I said, I call that the status cluster. Um, this is a strict type definition. All clusters should be strict type definitions in my, in my view. Um, so it's a cluster. That's a strict type def. Um, it may contain presentation information. So this is where the lines get a tiny bit fuzzy. Um, so what I mean by that is, if the user has a preference, so you were talking about knowing, when you guys were talking about knowing who the user was, well it may be that it knows that I am colorblind. So it, the view information by knowing that should, is going to need to know that, hey, I'm going to present it maybe in a different color scheme than if it knows I'm not colorblind. Um, and it should, this model should be organized as cluster, you, just for convenience, this is speed implementation. Um, and it can include objects for abstraction. So just because I'm talking about the cube message handler and these sort of simple terms does not mean that, it, that you may not use object-oriented. Object-oriented can be very valuable for abstraction. Um, and it does not confuse inputs with feedback. And this is a, a stumbling block I want to talk about for a minute. So, wait, I'll go back. Um, so the this is a point that I see younger programmers do, and it leads to a lot of problems. So imagine that you have a process that you would like to start, and you'd like to have a start <coughs> button. And the, um, you would like to have that start button represent through its color whether the process has been start, is in process or not in process. Okay. The fact that you press the start button does not mean that the process is is working. So the way that I would do things is I would say that when you press the button, it sends out a command. 
the state of the button does not change color until a response is received. That's feedback from whoever's controlling this process that yes, indeed, my process is starting. Okay. What new programmers that come to me uh, do, I catch them doing sometimes is when you press the start button, it assumes that the process starts. And so they will they will display information that's, they, they'll maybe change the button yellow or something to indicate that the process has been started. When in fact, you don't know that it's started. Right? It might be that the engine that's supposed to be starting it is busy, or that engine has gone down in flames. And so if you, you're deceiving yourself by showing that command as feedback. So model view controller, we're separating out the model from the view of the controller, but also keep in mind that in the model, you want to separate out input from feedback. And you want to be very clear with yourself, is this input or is this feedback? One of the um, things you want to think about is like, say if you have something called status, that probably should be feedback, not command. So, all right, just a mini rant on that. But, okay, so we're actually going to define our blue box QMH states. Um, we're going to start with the JET standard I, I showed earlier. So at JET, we have some standard states that we include. Um, we have six standard states. We have a VI initialized state that by default is the very first one that executes on all of our queue message handlers. Um, we have an event check state, which is the one that has the event structure in it if it's a user interface. Um, we have an error handler state that anytime there's an error, it automatically runs. Um, we have a VI exit state, which when there's a reason to exit, it goes there to get it's to, to decide what it should do as part of shutdown. We have a VI stop state, which is the last one that executes by definition. And then we have an invalid state. That's the default state that catches if I'm really bad at typing. So it catches if I make a typo on my um, in my state navigation, it will prompt me. Okay. So go ahead. So let's define some of our QMH states for the view for inputs. So what, what do we need in our QMH to capture the view inputs? Okay, so a login, a login control. So I'm not talking specifically about each control we would need. I'm talking about what states in our state machine do we need to capture the view inputs. So would you have a separate state in your state machine to capture login information? Where would that be? Yeah. Right? Well, you would need a view to enter the information. Whenever the user in LabVIEW enters information, where, do you, where does that show up? It shows up in the event structure. Right, so that's, I'm, I'm leading, that was a leading question, go ahead. So basically, all the event structure cases, it says event check cases, I got that confused because that's my state that has the event structure in it. But all the cases in the event structure, that's basically all your view inputs. Like, you might have other inputs that aren't view inputs, so like your slot, if you, um, if the user slides their card, it might get me a message comes in, that's a different kind of input. Um, but all your view inputs are, you're basically going to find in your, in your event structure, your event checks. All right, view outputs. This one's a little more challenging. Um, what kinds of, of states might we have in the view output? Remember I talked about having a pro one property node per controller indicator. So our convention at JET is to have a control update state and an indicator update state. So the control update one, the control update state, all it's going to do is update the controls. So that's where we have local variables. That's where we have property nodes for control. So if you want to disable a control, it's going to be in our control update state. Like we can guarantee it. Any of our programmers know. Go look at control update. That's where it's going to be. And then indicator update state, that's going to update the, the um, the property nodes and the values of all of my indicators. So all my indicator terminals are an indicator update. Completely separate from the rest of the program. Okay. Okay. And by definition, control update in our conventions navigates from control update to indicator update. 
So it, we create this hierarchy so that way when we're in any given state, that if we do control update, we trust that all the indicators are also in the update. And what that means is that every time we go to update the screen, we update all of the screen. Okay, that's the way that we do things. Now, you might have a more complex use case. Everyone knows graphs might have some latency associated with it. Might it might plot a freaking lot of data, and you might not want to hit it as often as you do the controls and updates. Or you might have a lot of controls in the front panel. So you might have multiple control states, multiple indicator update states. So you might set up something like this, where you say, you know what, I got some more, I've been getting all this analog data, maybe once per second I'm gonna update the graph, maybe five times a second I'll update the graph. So I'm gonna go to my graph update state. When I do that, I'm also gonna do control update, which then navigates control update two, which then goes to the indicator update, then indicator update two. Or you might have tables that you only wanna update on certain you know, based on certain changes. Or you might have uh, a view, like, like, like a tab control or maybe a sub panel, something like that, <clears throat> that you would do. So um, in these complex use cases, I'm not saying that control update and indicator update are the only thing you can do. You have a lot of flexibility. The point is that all of these states do not do any business logic. All they do is update the screen. And that every time you update the screen, you update pretty much everything. That's how you capture all of that if and or type stuff that I was showing at the very beginning, is by having it in only one place, by having only one uh, property node, um, this is how you would implement that. Okay, so what QMH states might we have for controller? Remember all that stuff you have to do, right? Well, here's some examples. Might load the movie menu. Might load the selected movie specifications. That's what you're talking about, about the, you know, what awards has it won and what's the synopsis of the plot. Um, you might add it to the cart. You might clear the cart because the user walked away and canceled the whole thing. You might accept payment. You might process payment. Like, all these things are things you do, right? Now, another option would be to have a convention of how do you how do you name your states? And I don't know if anybody here is passionate about names. Um, I'm pretty passionate about names. So one potential naming convention would be to sort of try to go with a noun, colon, verb kind of structure. And what's nice about it, if you do something like that, is, is it kind of self-sorts into categories. So if you're operating on the cart, then you've got cart add and cart clear. And then together in the state machine, you can organize it. So I would recommend considering something like that. I'm not like hard and fast on you have to do things this way, but um, it can provide some value if you think about naming conventions for your states. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So you've got your standard states, which you can define your own if you want. You've got your controller states. These are the things that do. You have your view states. You have event check cases. And then you've got your, your control update, indicator update, graph update, view update, plot update, whatever it is. Any questions? Let me stop here for just a second. Does so anyone see how that model view controller concept just directly applies to Qt Message Handler if you adopt certain conventions? And that's what I'm recommending. Now, scalability is the real payoff here. So what if your requirements change, and you can imagine some of those, we've even talked about some of those, the user rewards, colorblind display, inventory management, remote price updates. Well, it's pretty easy if you can imagine, you know, you can sit here and look at these and say, oh, if I got user rewards, well, I'm gonna input another controller state, which is look up the user. Another one maybe apply rewards. Another one maybe prompt the user to sign up for my extra service that'll only cost another 50 cents per movie, or whatever. Right? So you can insert those in the controller states, and then the view state will still update everything based off of all information in reality. So it may be that you have one or two slight changes to make in the view outputs, because maybe you've added a new option. But the change is gonna be minimal. The, cha the, in the change in requirements is gonna have minimal impact on your view, um, as opposed to if you had combined your controller and your view states, things could get really complicated really fast. 
So that's what I have to say. Um, that's my uh, intended takeaways are that hopefully you got a good understanding now of what model view controller means just in general. It's kind of a simple concept. Um, hopefully you, you can see how decoupling can help you in terms of scalability and supportability. Um, and hopefully you can apply, you can see how you can apply the MVC to any huge message handling code that you have and with some practical tips and conventions to get you started. So hopefully, you can come tell me next year when you see me at NI Week, hopefully what you'll say is, you know, I applied that and my QMH programming got way better, got way more scalable, got way simpler. Um, and just uh, as a bonus material, um, I also uh, recommend um, kind of organizing your state machine, the order of your states. And we actually put in states that have no function other than to have names that are in the list. So if you look at any of our queued message handling uh, ones, we have a section called standard states with all of them in there. And we have a section called menu commands, a section called message handling, a section called actions. And then window and panel is all the updating stuff. So opening the window, updating controls, updating communications, and things like that. So if you're looking for an additional convention, I would recommend that. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, open for any questions. That's a good question. So I'm putting that that logic is part of the view. Because, yeah, so the question was, let's go back to that slide. It's pretty early on. Um, you know it's one carpet? Where we've got all the different requirements for, for disabling the start. Um, but the answer is that we would uh, put that in the just control update state or, or indicator update state. Now, if you were really worried about it, you could potentially make it a sub BI and then have it write some some state information using the status cluster. That's a that's kind of UI state information. But what you find if you do that is there's so many different places and conditions that you end up dropping that sub BI in a bunch of places, and it's like why not just do it every time, right where it matters? You know that kind of logic doesn't typically take much time. Um, so this is what he was talking about here. It's like, well, when doing the ors here. Now the and part, the and part is part of the controller, right? It's if there's a timer out there, and if the user is inactive, and it's going to, you know, log the user out and stop and reset and all that kind of thing. Um, that's part of the controller, but once that control, once that logout thing happens, it immediately goes to view update or the control update state, and that control update state then knows, as part of that that logic of do I want my my start button to be enabled or disabled, it knows the user's not logged in, so by definition you disable it. Yeah. And I mean I've I've got <laughs> some user interface that have a crazy number of controls and indicators. I've been working with this one customer for four years now developing this control system. And it seems like every couple of weeks, he's like, oh, can you add this? Can you add that? Can you add the other thing? And so the, con the conditions under which I enable and disable things have changed just radically over the last four years. And so my control and indicator update states, I mean, that's pretty extensive. There's a lot of stuff in there. But it's all fairly simple logic. So whenever I get any, even the most complicated stuff, like literally a couple of weeks ago, he said, oh, well, your, your, my start production button is disabled under so many different conditions that I'm having problems because my operators don't know why it's disabled. So now I want you to give me a tip strip that tells me which of the conditions have caused it to be disabled. I'm like, all right, fine. But... The beauty is that this, all that logic is in one spot. So I just took that logic, I cleaned it up a little bit, 
and I made it into a sub VI, and now that sub VI has like every condition I could possibly want, outputs a particular string, which is basically the most important reason why it was disabled. So even that is a proof of the concept. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of mentioned earlier, but what are your tips on uh, periodically updating your control uh, updates or find, inducing that, that periodic update? Right, well, there's two things you might mean there. Um, are you talking about the user login thing, or are you just talking no, about... just control update, so say okay. you have a, a, a clock timer that you need to use. Right, so I don't typically use timers um, for stuff. I, I Almost all my code's event-driven, so it's driven in response to something happening. Now, the case that when I was talking about that, I was talking about where the, uh, where the thing that is happening periodically is data. So, like, you might have a data stream come in. Maybe, let's say, 100 times a second, you get 100 data points of various types of whatnot. Well, if you're plotting that data and over, like, a long period of time, you have, like, a long buffer, two hours worth of data, say, you might not want to actually update the graph 100 times a second because the user is not really going to be able to take that in. It'll take a lot of potential, potentially take a lot of processor time, might steal some resources from another process. So what you might do instead is say, you know what, every single time I get data, I'm going to buffer it, but every tenth time is when I'm going to update it. And that's why what I was recommending was maybe you have a case that's specific to updating that graph. So every tenth time, or every time it gets data, it might update the indicators because that's <coughs> where like your Maybe you've got sliders or whatever that are just the current state of any given data point are on the screen. You might want to update that all the time. But that history buffer, maybe you only want to update a couple once or a couple of times a second. So then you would separate that, that graph update state from all your normal control indicator update states. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah? Give me advice for testing the different states like in past projects I've done, I found it very challenging to like find all the corner cases that will trigger a change in state in the view. Okay. Um, so one of the downsides to queued message handling programming in general that I think um, like an a actor framework kind of thing helps with is if you do want to do unit testing of your states. Um, we don't tend to do a lot of that. Um, what I do if I'm worried about it on the view specifically, like you mentioned, is I make sub VIs. Then I can unit test those sub VIs so I have all my logic coming in from the left, and then I have the outputs of my disable to the right. So you can unit test that, right? But it's still not always quite the same as kind of the level of rigor you might be talking about. But that, that'd be the way I'd handle it, would be to put it in a, you know, just put it in a sub VI. Any other questions? All right, cool. Well, thanks a lot for coming. Oh, wait, no. So are each of the states in a message in the case structure? Or represent an active message? Or Let's go to the state machine picture. Um, so this is why I was talking about the queue message handler name can be a little bit deceiving. So at JET, we have a messaging framework that where all of our queue message handlers talk to each other that is completely and totally independent of the queued message handling code that I'm talking about now. So um, the queued message handling, like I said, I pr would prefer it if as a group, as a body, we rename the queued message handler to a queued task machine or queued met, queued task execution action, and I don't know how you, what you would call it, but really the idea is that it's simply going to perform a series of tasks in a particular order based off of you and queuing it, and you can obviously queue it in a different order. That's different from receiving messages in our, because the idea of receiving messages to me means somebody outside of me is telling me something, or I'm telling something outside of me to, about something. And, that is important because I was actually talking about the picture of the same machine. That actually is important um, because that usually is how your status cluster gets updated, right? So data is coming in as a message and then gets put in the status cluster. Or um, you might have configuration information coming in that goes in the status cluster. 
And then that configuration information, a good example would be user login information. So maybe you have an external user management module. So it's going to prompt the user for the password. And then once the user succeeds or fails in logging in, it's going to give you credentials. That will come in as a message. It'll get stored in your status cluster. And the only thing your module cares about is what is the reality of what is the current user allowed to do. And that, in the status cluster, is part of the model, which then will be reflected whenever you update the view. Does that make sense? OK. There is somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whenever I make this, I always use type that but all the tools that are fine with scripts, how do I have them all? OK. Good question. So I think what you said, or tell me if I'm wrong, is that the Q, all the um, state machines that you do, you use enums. I assume they're strict type FPS. Yeah. Good. That's the only way to do enums correctly <laughs> for a student state machine. Um, and that a lot of others you see use strings. And what he asks is, a am I doing something wrong? Uh, the answer is no, not really. But there are certain benefits from using strings that you don't get from using enums. The primary benefit from using enums is you can't fat finger a state wrong, right? The primary benefit of using strings is you can it, is that you can do lots of other stuff. So a good example here is our, our Qt state machine uh, little toolkit here. Um, it can take a list of states to That's execute. That's an array? That's not an array, no. But it would be. Well, yeah, you could, you could make it, uh, absolutely you could. Um, is there another reason to use a uh, string? Well, I guess the only other thing is just uh, you know the updating a strict type there. But no, I don't. Yeah, you got a reason? Yeah, I mean, when I used to do it with uh, that too, but you were always you could take that code and port it over to another application because you know everything that was set up for that application was no longer applicable to whatever you wanted to do the next. Whereas this, you can. Sorry. Yeah, but like, um, if the case is in your other app, if you want to use like an SMPI or something like that, you may not have all the same yeah. cases, and you have to build a whole new, even, you know. Some of the guys in the back I saw raise hands. Do you, do you transfer data with your strings? When you, do you transfer data with your state? Right, good question. Um, if you see over here, there's two wires coming out uh, of the read function, and that's how we transfer data. So we actually have a separate um, variant that we could potentially use to pass data from from any state to any other state. And then we also have what, I, what we call comment. It's a string. So um, we actually have initially used that for documentation purposes of why am I doing this in case uh, or in some, some circumstances. But you could also pass string data or you could potentially compress a string and then um, get it back into whatever data type if you didn't want to use the variant. So we do have that. Um, so that is something you could do with strings. But actually, we don't turn it into a string. We just have, a, in the background, we just have a cluster that's got like the state to go to. Here's my message string. And here's my, my variant data. Um, and then we use a queue in the background rather than use strings. You could if you were setting, you know, that's one implementation. I've seen in the past where something, JP, I may do this actually, where you do like your state name and then like if you do colon, colon, then you could put some some data information and then the, the, what's that? They do some arguments. Yeah, arguments, there you go. So, yeah, same concept, just different implementation. Might be an advantage to using strings if you want to do something. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you discuss a little bit about queuing to the front and queuing to the back? Like you guys. Yeah, sure. Your so this function on that. is polymorphic. So if you right click on it, you choose states. There's actually four different choices. Um, two of them we don't use anymore. So uh, next time I update the toolkit, I'm just going to get rid of them. Um, but uh, but one is queue to the front, queue to the back. So you can just change that. Um, it's pretty useful actually. Uh, so um, usually. Control update will stick. Control or indicator update on the front of the queue in case it's being called in sort of the middle of doing stuff. Um, so that way, indicator update. Like the idea is that 
Control update is like a superset of indicator update. So anytime I do control update, I always want to do indicator update because it would be silly not to. Um, so that's why control update usually queues in front. But that's definitely a, um, a feature of the toolkit. Another thing that's important, like if you're going to roll your own, I'll show you a couple other things I'd recommend. Um, if you look over here, we've got, um, this is your, your initialize, then you've got debug options. Um, debug options, uh, the, the, the toolkit actually has in it a cache of what states have been most recently run in addition to what states do I do next. So it has a future looking queue and a backward, uh, backward looking queue. So that way if I get an error, then I can output a like, hey, here's the last 20 states that executes and how long it took between each of them and things like that. So timing information is built in there. Um, so if, you, uh, if you're gonna roll your own, I'd like to recommend that you consider um, what kind of built-in debugging you would put into it because you can, if you're trying to fix a problem, then that kind of information can be very valuable. Another thing is you'll notice um, I mentioned that there's an error handler state. So what happens is this guy right here, um, I'm sorry, not that guy, this guy right here, uh, if any state generates an error, the error goes out here, it comes in here, and then instead of going to the next state on the queue, it actually automatically goes to the error handling state. So the error handling state then reads the error wire that's coming into it and then chooses what to do. Many times it will like go into some kind of suspended state or it might shut down or it might just ignore the error and, and continue on. It might clear the queue. Lots of different choices there. Um, we kind of code that up on a module by module basis. Um, but that's another thing that maybe is hidden behind the scenes. If you roll your own, you'll definitely want to do that. So rather than put a separate error handler thing out here, I would put it over there. It's just make it part of the read. So it'll go straight to the next, uh, to the air handler right away. It's super convenient. Did someone back there raise their hand? Let's see. No, I'm just stretching. Yeah. So does this uh, sit in the event check and wait for the thing, or does it keep telling me something to come back to the thing? Good question. No. Um, by default, it will sit and wait here forever. You'll see in the top left-hand corner that there's no timeout <laughs> wired there. Um, we do have cases where we have to pull, but I, I really hate pulling. Um, I just avoid it like the plague. But you know, sometimes people make you use serial devices, and sometimes serial devices require you to pull. That's the best example I have. Um, and so, if we have to pull, then what we'll do is we'll we, our messaging framework has a built-in timer. Are we done? I haven't been watching the time, sorry. Um, you're, you got, this is your five minute warning. Okay, thank you. The last three you run long, so they told me to come morning. I really appreciate that, because the one right before me ran a little long too, so I get that. So um, yeah. In this, in the event check, I assume it can handle messages from other uh, That's a whole other talk. So the answer is, what you're looking at now, no. Because I just gin this up quick for this to just focus on the queue message handling. Um, the long answer is if you, you know, a messaging framework should uh, have a timer up top there and then it should have a, a uh, event, a special user event case for the message that comes in. Um, and you, there's lots of different implementations of that. I may, may show you mine next year or something, but it's, it's totally independent of what I'm talking about right now. But all that that state looks like is when it gets the message in, it just knows the name of the message, and it just that there's going to be a state which is the same name as that message, so it just goes to that. So it's it's a pretty simple implementation on, in terms of the queue message handling part. Yeah. Four. Right. So so that's where I talk about the. In our mind, the queued message handler and then the messages are totally independent. But you could, you're absolutely right, um, give this handle to some other uh, loop and then have that loop and queue stuff on your queued message handler. The problem with that is you have to pull, right? If you have a user interface, then it's either going to be looking at the input from the event structure or it's going to be looking at the input from the uh, QSM. 
So you have to constantly be shifting back and forth. And that's my whole problem with polling. So, um, so we don't use the queue message handler to get messages in from external because of that fact, because I have to constantly be switching back and forth while I'm checking. So that's why we use the structure, or in some cases, we use a queue for engines that come in. Why don't I use the structure and set the file? Um, so you're talking producer-consumer, basically. Yeah, because, well, the main reason is because for this demo, it made sense to only focus on one. I don't have a problem with producer-consumer, but typically in my use case, I have many producer, many consumer. So that one-to-one -one, uh, communication pathway doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Instead, I have a many-to-many -many, um, messaging framework that answers questions for me. Yes, you absolutely could. I find that to be just overcomplicated. Like, I mean, anyway, I guess I ought to shut down now. So, any questions? Uh, fill out the survey if you would.